the rest of us, it's Philippians uh, chapter 4. You have inside of your head a machine that is absolutely incredible. We call it the brain. You may have a really high IQ, it might be average, or you might be from Ohio, and it'd be a little lower. I'm from Ohio, so if you're offended. Um, <clears throat> your brain is pretty amazing no matter your IQ. Did you know that inside your skull, in that little area there, there is stored the amount of information of the Library of Congress with 17 million volumes. That's how much is in there in this little thing that weighs maybe three pounds. Quite amazing. Psychologists tell us that we have 10,000 thoughts a day. No wonder you take a nap. You have to. You should. 10,000 thoughts a day. That's remarkable. And much of the process that goes on in these brains of ours that we learn from scientists or psychologists is unknown. One interesting mystery of the brain is that we're not even sure what it's made up of. Of course, it's gray matter, white matter, various neurons and cells, but there's so much more that it's really not understanding on how this works. One scientist at the Allen Institute said this, how can we understand the entire brain if we don't understand even what the components are of it? How does it compute? Billions of components coming together to figure out one problem. How does it sleep and dream? Where are memories stored and retrieved? Actually, reading a few articles this week on the brain and the makeup scientifically of the brain, I wonder that we know anything more than the fact of I think we know where it's located. But here's something we all know. This is something that all fields know, and that is how we think affects our life. How you think and what you think about has a great effect to how we represent ourselves and how we grow as a person, how we affect others. So this beautiful joy that we find in Philippians, in Christ, that he's our example, he's our life, he's our sufficiency. We have it, but so much of who we are is what we do and what we think about. If you have any experience, either personally or as a family or, or maybe professionally in the field of mental illness, we all know that these neuro pathways in the mind that have been created through our life, that they're like ruts, and based on how you think is how you feel and what you do. And so, so much of therapy and medical therapy, cognitive therapy, is to change those pathways, change the mind, because if you change the mind, you change everything else. So we're going to talk about the role of the mind today. But first, I want a preliminary point. I want us to come together on one idea that I want us to understand, believe, and be convinced that what you think is how you end up living. The Bible verse is a very simple one. It's Proverbs 23 that simply says, but as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. It's a Bible passage. It's just one. As you think, so you are. If you want to gain more control over your inner contentment, take control of your thoughts. As we think, we are. It's a biblical principle that psychology agrees with. Religious faiths agree with it. We also know it practically. Ask a teacher or a coach. The mind game, 
how you are mentally going to the meet or to the game is critical for the outcome. Am I right? We lose often before we even step out onto the court because of the mind. There was a dad that was trying to teach his kid that principle, and the kid said, I have a math test tomorrow. I'm going to do horrible. I'm just going to do horrible on it. The dad says, all right, teaching moment. He goes, positive attitude. Positive attitude. It's going to make all the difference. The kid says, okay, I am positive I'm going to do horrible on that test tomorrow. There's no doubt in my mind. Well, that's not exactly the idea. The idea is, and it's chicken before the egg. Am I depressed? Does that affect my thinking, or does my thinking affect the fact that I'm depressed? Immoral. Am I immoral, and that's why I think so poorly? Well, according to the Scriptures, it's as you think you are. There's a handful of some of the greatest scientists and thinkers in the world. Kepler, Galileo, Pascal, some of the greatest thinkers ever that are devout believers, and as believers who spend time focusing on God, there is this thought, pro- there's this conditioning and changing of the mind that affects everything else. Isaac Newton one of the greatest scientists the world has ever known. It wasn't until 1936 at an auction that it was discovered. Isaac Newton wrote more on theology than he did on science. He himself said, before I go into a laboratory, before I go into study, I spend my time in God's Word because it illumines my mind. It makes me think. And if I can interact with the Creator, I am more likely going to understand what He created. It's remarkable. Now, I read a little bit about Isaac Newton this week, and there's this, this cute gal that tried to imitate his schedule. She's a, she's a blogger, and she did this on a video. Uh, Isaac Newton studied 18 hours a day studied 18 hours a day. So this gal, she opened up all her stuff. He also did it by candlelight. He did not exercise. There's wisdom in that. How many of you have been hurt exercising? That'll never happen to me. So he didn't exercise. He barely ate. And so this this cute gal, she got out all her stuff, and she went by candlelight, and she tried to see how focused she could be. Well, Isaac Newton himself was an extraordinary person of studying 18 hours a day and then often just keep going because he just can't stop. But what a statement that he made that I first study the Scriptures. No better source of that which is right and it cleans, it organizes, it creates those new narrow pathways, and then he applied it to science. We are what we think. All that we are arises with our thoughts. With our thoughts, we make the world. That was Buddha, 4th, 5th century. C.S. Lewis, we are what we believe we are. Socrates, we are what we think we are. There's a New York best-selling author, James Geary, wrote a book on the wisest and wittiest sayings in the world, and the title of it is, We Are What We Think. So this week, I'm reading about it, and I'm studying it, and I'm just kind of looking at fascinating quotes and You know, among other things, I find that it is about every field will give a nod to this idea. So then all of a sudden, I'm like, okay, let me think about my thought life. How lazy it can be. How much there should be boundaries. So having lived in Arizona, we did for 30 years, 10 of those years up near Sedona, The rest was in Phoenix. We happen to be a big fan of building a wall. I mean, if there's ever a place, there should be a wall between California and Arizona. 
and there needs to be a wall built there. Is that not funny? Was that not funny to anybody, really? Oh, kind of? All right. Well, you've never been to California then. It's a great idea. If they would stop coming over and ruining Arizona, I think it would be a much better place. There's order. There has to be order. Take the other border. Maybe not talked about as much, but there's a border between Arizona and Mexico. There should be beautiful colored gates that are wonderful to say to the world, yes, come legally through a process, and we need to have a better process to bring immigrants into the country. We, that would be so good for us. But the rest of it should be a wall of some sort, somehow a protection, right? We're, I think we're all for legal immigration. Well, our minds are so similar. We're, we're letting everything go in. We went to Liberty University when Jerry Falwell, it was kind of the height of a lot of the growth that took place. He had a photographic memory, so his family and his kids would be careful with what he saw and what he read because he would see it or hear it, and he just wouldn't forget it. And I wonder if we all had a similar protection of keeping out what shouldn't be there and a more steady inflow of what should be there. The reason? Because whatever we're allowing to happen in our mind is exactly what we end up being and doing. We're a product of that. It's a simple principle. It's probably a junior high lesson. It'd be a great junior high lesson to tell our kids, man, what you read and who you spend time with, your hobbies, how you train your mind is how you will live, I promise. And then all of a sudden I realize, yeah, it's a good junior high lesson. And there's probably a lot of good junior high lessons that I need, and that would be one. That's good for us. It's a good reminder so if you look in your Bible to Philippians 4, 8, after all this wonderful talk about who Jesus is, he kind of gives like, I'm wrapping things up. He says, finally, brothers. Like, I've told you all about Jesus. I've told you about his humility, his example. I've given you instruction. I've taught you so much. Finally, now, brothers, whatsoever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is holy, whatever is commendable. If there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. It is such an important next step from what we know to what we dwell on. This is very much like Paul. He's pulling a trick that he does over and over. If you look in the book of Colossians, Colossians is a simple four chapters. The first half is a lot of what to think. The last half is practical application. The transition, chapter 3, verse 1, since then you've been raised with Christ, since you have known Jesus and he's, you've trusted him for eternal life and everything that he's done, the supremacy of Jesus, all the head knowledge, since that, set your mind on things above where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. This is all true. Now, train your mind to set your mind on things above. The knowledge, we understand it, we know it, is one thing. The application of it and allowing it to constantly go through our mind in the training, retraining of our mind to think on the right things is another. So now I get it. <clears throat> now I see how secular radio, it's not that it's bad. It's just not helpful. 
So we get rid of all of it? No, there's some great old classics and whatever you like to listen to, but to now gauge it, we now have something to gauge. If it's nothing but an influx of godless, I don't mean that in the negative sense of it's dirty, it's bad. I just mean it as a descriptive sense that it is music that is without God. If my steady inflow of music in my life is music that is without God and His principles of love and care and justice and wholesome and pure, it's without that, I will be that. <laughs> That's it. If my friends, if my key associates are godless, not critical, just observation, they are without God, good people, ton of fun, but they are without God. If they are my steady relationships, it's training my mind on how to live life, experience family, experience job, experience dreams and future without God. I'm being trained. No, all we were doing was having a drink and talking. Yeah, that, that, that's it. Train the mind to live, to prosper. What is prosperity? We define it in a setting that is without God, and we're the same. And yet we know theology better than the church has ever known. We at least have access to more knowledge of Christian things than you'll ever dream of having. Honestly, too much. There is so much available. You can grow mentally like just facts, laying out facts, and you can alliterate it or not if you want to, and we could learn all of this. That's not the problem. The problem is taking that and allowing our minds to dwell on it, to think about these things, where it allows itself to work through our brains to actually start rearranging and thinking the way we were originally created to think. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity and not in multiplicity or confusion of things. Truth is ever to be found in simplicity. That's Isaac Newton who said that. <laughs> Wish he wrote that way. What a genius. Unbelievable the things that he has discovered and how the universe works. Gravity, laws of motion. How did he read some of his theology. Google some of that this week. He should be known as one of the greatest theologians, but he discovered so much, and I know that's anecdotal, they'd call that. You take somebody or something as the example, but I have a feeling in this room many of you could say the same thing. For those of you who came to know Jesus as an adult, was there a reprogramming of your mind? Kind of give me the nod if that's true, if you, if you know of that. Think for a minute. What helped you transform the mind? What helped you immerse and think more like him? What did you do that helped you change the mindset? to think more with God than how you were raised. Those of you that came to know Christ as an adult, you had your entire upbringing more or less without God, thinking like the world. You had to change that. 
you keep changing it. In that process, what are the pieces that helped you more than anything change the mindset? What could you yell out to me? Simply church. You at least know you have one morning a week where you can get kind of snapped back. What were other disciplines that you did? What did you do to help you reprogram? Yeah. The music I listen to. Music's a big one. Who else? Come on, don't be shy. Yeah. Yeah, radio. Don't be shy. Just yell one out. I won't make you stand and come up here. Yeah, thanks. Interesting. Good. Well, we are holistic. We're one of the few cultures, the Western mind, that compartmentalizes everything. That was never done before. It was life. But for us, it's mental, psychological, physical. And the truth, isn't it true, if you got lazy physically, your mind gets lazy, right? Right? And for many, if you stay physically, it affects how sharp the mind can be. So, yeah, good for you. I see that. What's that? Yeah, starting to see God more, recognize God more in nature. We recognize God in events. So he gives us the template right here. And it's interesting in the Greek, I just, I don't know, I studied Greek so long ago, but at least I can follow it along a little bit. I was curious if he said, finally, brothers, whatever is true, honorable, just, pure, lovely, or did he really repeat over and over, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, and he did that. He extended it. That's for emphasis. You can give a big list. What, what should I put on my hamburger? You should put on the hamburger lettuce. You should put on the hamburger cheese. You should put on the hamburger tomato. You should put on the hamburger french fries. I just said that. That's horrible. I just said that because I'm new, and I knew you guys would like that. So he extended that in order to get you think of each one individually. That would, be the, that would be the tool that he used. Whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think on these things. He's describing to us how we're to live. And so just think about your day. For those of us and so many of us in the room that you read a devotional or something in the morning and you kind of get focused, you can now see how easily then we could detach that from the rest of our day. It is with God for the moment, the rest of the day, godless. It is without God friends, co-workers, some that you have no control over, some of your own family without God. The influx is all there. There's an, uh, there's an easy way to, um, uh, to do this. It would be to be secluded. It's monasticism. They did it forever, and they just seclude themselves. They just go away, and they keep away from the world so they can stay focused on God. That is probably an easy way to do it. We always look at that, how hard of a life that would be. Not if you want to stay focused on God. It's pretty easy. Show me the believer in Christ who actually lives in the world without being of the world. Am I right? Some of you who go to work and you're facing it all day, they're good people. They're good people. But you're facing all day long in an association or a team or a work environment that is just without God, and you have to stand firm and try to keep your mind clean and straight and how difficult that's going to be. 
Just read the very next verse. What you have learned and received and heard and seen in me, practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. He says, think about these things, and there's six of them. They're different. They're all positive. They're all traits from God. And then he says, because what you've learned from me, you've received it from me, you've heard me and seen me, practice those. See, I've done that for you. That's what Paul's saying. I have been that. I've been holy and pure and commendable. I've taught it, and I've been that. I'm now saying live in it and practice it. And then the peace of God will be with you. See, peace is a byproduct. When we ask God, I need, I, give me peace, I think if he were to speak audibly to you, and he might, he would say, well, you do the things that produce peace. It's not like in a jar where he says, give me peace, and he goes, oh, let me just get it off the shelf. Uh, let me see. What do you ask for, peace? Pull it out, open it, and dump it. It's a byproduct. We saw it just earlier in this very same passage. Take a look at Philippians 4. He says in verse 5, let your reasonableness be known to everyone. The Lord is at hand. Don't be anxious, but in everything, prayer, supplication, thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and mind. Do this, live this way, and the peace of God, which transcends understanding, will guard your hearts and minds. It's a byproduct. We see it here as well in this verse. What you have learned, received, heard, and seen in me, practice these things, and the peace of God of peace will be with you. It's a byproduct. So this is a good reminder. That's all it is today. It's a reminder for us. Um, Being a potato chip lover that I am, that's why I'm shaped like a potato chip, because I consume so many, that when we realize we might be moving to Pennsylvania, that's like the state. That should be the motto. It's the potato chip. Pretzels are fine. I'm good with that. But it's like there are potato chip factories everywhere, right? I mean, it's unbelievable. We need one in town, whatever. But in my mind, recently, I'm like, okay, have you ever been in the place where you just got a little too lazy with the eating? I mean, you know, it's like chocolate chip Who says no to a Chips Ahoy chocolate chip cookie? You know you could put a stack, let's say four of those, typically six, in a microwave for like 25 seconds in a stack, and then when you grab it and put it in the milk, it goes tss. <laughs> Heaven's going to be that sound. Everywhere you go, it's going to be tss. And I'm like, oh, this is heaven, and it's crunchy on the outside, soft. I'm not kidding. Do it. You, you do it. Do it. You need to get your stack of, and it's unbelievable. It's so tasty. In high school, I played on the tennis team. I was actually fit then, but my breakfast might have been the reason I was fit. My breakfast was a stack of about eight Chips Ahoy cookies in the microwave, and then you dunk every one in milk. I'm just excited. Yeah, this is the most excited I've been all morning was talking about these cookies in the milk. But then all of a sudden, one day, we're all like, okay, we need to back off. And whether you decided to dry January, which was a big deal this year, I saw on the NPR they were talking about it. Whatever you do where you're like, you know what, physically, I need to reel it in. Just physically, I need to reel it in a little bit. Still do the cookies, but I'll do two. Yeah, that's better. Just reel it in. That's the encouragement today with the mind. Don't do life, don't do big, reel it in. Recognize it. Maybe that would be a huge week. Just recognize the influx of things that are not good and healthy and go, ooh, I could curb that back. The binge watching, 
ah, maybe reel that in. Maybe be care more careful of what's being been watched. It's programming the mind. Don't think that it's not. It's programming the mind. It's reinforcing all of those things pre-Jesus in your life. How the world had taught you are still teaching us through various means, and whether it's music, whether it's movies, TV, books, conversations, messaging, habits, hobbies, is training our mind to think a particular way. So let's stand together, and we're going to stand together and dismiss, and we're going to dismiss by reading this one verse. And we're just going to read that together, and that's going to be kind of our little, our little commitment. You're doing it out loud, and so we're going to dismiss by reading this together. Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any excellence, if there is anything worthy of praise, think about these things. Heavenly Father, we're committing ourselves to you to some progress. Thank you for some progress in this area of protecting our minds. Help us to focus on those things that are full of you. Bless this week as we continually walk with you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen. There